Good morning, church. Good morning, Washera Community Church. Um, thank you for joining us. We're glad that we can be together this way. And we look forward to seeing you face to face as we can, you know, as that works. But right now, we're glad this happens. And, and, and again, who knows how it will be in the future for our country. Maybe this is a, a good trial run for what's coming ahead. You know, I don't know. Um, I'm just glad you could be here and that we can kind of be together like this. Can I just pray for you right now? Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. And Lord Jesus, our de desire this day is not just to learn or be to be uh, educated or certainly not to be entertained. But God, we pray that your word, that we get it, that we, be, we learn from your word, that it would have a place in our life. God, please open your word to us. We can get the words, but God, unless you open them, we'll never be able to apply them. So please, oh God, Speak through me, God. Use your word to touch the hearts and minds of those who are listening. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, as you know, we've been going through the book of Philippians. And the reason we have is because I was pretty convinced that last year was a tough year. And there are a lot of tough things that still remain. The Apostle Paul was in tough times. Maybe like you, uh, um, I have always been amazed at the people who experience hardship, like POW camps. You know, I've heard stories of people who in World War II just cursed God, you know, blaspheming him and said, if there was a God, he wouldn't have happened. Well, others in the same experience, exact same experience said, are you crazy? God's all we've got. If we lose God, we lose everything. So two people experiencing the same thing saw it differently. Paul was experiencing prison. And he saw things differently than many of us experience. So you still experience very difficult things. So how do we see then our experience through the eyes, you know, of Scripture? So Paul says, I'll read the whole passage here, in, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. Well, what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. Yes, now I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't, I don't know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in this body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. So now we've got Paul's glasses. And, and he will say, verse 12, Brothers, I want you to know. Now, um, you can... One of the things that, that probably he said that is because they didn't know. That is, they, it wasn't clear to them what Paul was about to say. So I want you to know something that may not have been clear to you before because many of you know what was going on in Acts chapter 14, uh, verse 21. They were just hammering good things. Uh, they, uh, verse uh, 20, so they left for Derby and, and they preached the good news in that city and they won a large number of disciples, not just converts, disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch and strengthened the disciples and encouraged them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And they, uh, and they said, and, and, and Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in every church 
and with prayer and fasting, committing them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Uh, man, I mean, so they were like, they were having evangelistic work that was really, really cool. And then they were like, like okay, you're, you're a disciple now, so you're not just a convert. So they made little churches and stuff. And they said, you, 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 and you, we believe the Spirit of God wants you guys to be leaders here. So we're not going to nurse you. You, you. You're like on your own, but here are the leaders we believe God's called you. So they're like encouraging and planting. It's all good. And then everything went like gaflooey. Um, over in Acts chapter 21, they're doing the same thing. Except with Acts 21, Paul is in Jerusalem. Oh my. Uh, in Acts 21, verse 27, it says, uh, when seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. Got to be Jerusalem. And they stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Men of Israel, help us. This man is this man is the man who teaches all men everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple area and defiled this holy place, which is, of course, false. Uh, they had previously seen Trophimus and the, the Ephesian in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple area. The whole city was aroused, and the people came, running from all directions, seizing Paul. They dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. And while they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He once took some officers, and soldiers and ran down the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and, they, and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Paul says, Do you all know that in Philippians 1, he says, I want you to know that what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. It's like, excuse me? You were advancing the gospel just fine. And then somebody decided you brought a Greek in the temple, and then now you're in jail. He said, yeah, I am. But I want you to see this. In the midst of my trouble, God has used my trouble to further the gospel. How? Uh, look at Acts 28, please. This is a cool verse. Acts uh, 28. Yep. Um, he will say... Uh, in verse 16, when we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. And for verse 30, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. So even though he was still in jail... He was allowed not to be in a dungeon someplace, but he allowed to, to have his own house, which somebody else, like the church at, at the Philippi, helped pay for. And he was allowed to be there. And when he was there, people came to see him. And everyone who came to see him, he talked about the gospel. Look back at Philippians chapter 1, verse 13. As a result, it was become clear throughout the whole palace, guard, and everyone else that I was in chains for Christ. So not only did... Jews and others come to see Paul in jail. He was literally chained to a guard. And and these guards, you know, would ask, or they would talk or whatever, you know, I'm sure they would. So why are you here expecting to hear some barrage against Rome or against against Israel or the Jews? Paul didn't say any of that. He just preached Christ. So everyone knew that Paul was not in jail for some political thing. He wasn't really mad about the politics of the time. Well, he really was being proactive about the gospel. Look, I don't care about Rome. I don't care about Israel. I care about the gospel. And my setting, my heart, has made the gospel more, uh, it's advanced its purpose, not hindered it. So I would argue then that one of the things that allowed Paul to see differently than maybe some of us see is that he absolutely believed that the good that, that God would make good happen out of bad. That sounds good for Paul. How does that apply to you? If I ask you some of the bad things that you've experienced or are experiencing right now, some of you could say some pretty powerful things. Some of you would say some really hard things. I tell you, to the believer 
who has on different glasses, you will be able to see God's hand doing something good even in the midst of your bad. So I'm going to use a name. I haven't asked permission. Please forgive me. Some of you know Kathy Schmidt. Dear soul, been here for the last four or five years. No, been here for a lot longer than that. But but had cancer for the last four years. Um, and uh, that's bad. Um, it's not good. Kathy will say today what she's always said. If God gives me a day, I'm good. If God takes me home, I'm good. Either way, I'm good. There is good, sometimes even through the bad. Her family is wonderful. I mean, they're like showing up and supporting and being really encouraging. And, you know, her attitude is like amazing. And she's home and, I don't know, it's just an example of how so many of you really, really can see God's hand even through and in the heart. For those who you, of you who haven't seen that yet or experienced that yet, I'm going to ask you to change your glasses and allow the Spirit of God to help you see. He might not change your situation one bit, but oh God, would you show your people like you showed Paul how your situation can work for the furthering of the gospel. Um, you know, so I don't know how that works for you. Paul would go on and he would say something else. It's, it's pretty cool. In verse uh, 18, he'd say, last part, because of this, because, oh, I missed the whole spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, sorry. He goes on, he says, you know, uh, verse uh, 15. No, verse uh, 14. Because of my change, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. So my experience here, others said, ooh, Paul's not doing it, so I better do it. So they stepped up. Others who were not as popular as Paul saw Paul in jail and thought, ha, I'll take his popularity. If he was in Derby, he's not there. I'll go back to Derby and I'll be popular again. Paul said, you know what? I don't care. I don't care how it all happens. I just care that what's the matter. The important thing, verse 18, is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. <sighs> yeah. Then he goes on and he says, you know what? I, I do rejoice because there's good even in my bad. The gospel is being furthered even in my bad. And I rejoice because I am sure that I will have deliverance. He says this in verse uh, 18. I know, I, I will continue to rejoice. I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that what has happened for, to me will turn out for my deliverance. Paul absolutely believed that he would be delivered. And you can kind of tell that in verse 25. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and the joy in the faith, so that through my being with you, again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. And so, you know, that's a pretty cool thing. Why did he believe that? He believed that because of verse 19. I know that through your prayers, people were praying for him all the time. I found a verse just today. Um, in, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, uh, and the context is this, the, the, the scroll was there, but no one was, was able to open the seals of the scroll. And then the lion of the tribe of Judah was there, and, and, uh, and it says that uh, he came forth, and the, well, I'll read it here. Revelation uh, chapter 5, verse 8. Um, it's about prayer. And he says, um, And when he had taken it, that is a scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. When your prayers go to heaven, God hears them. He puts them in a golden bowl, and he keeps them. So Paul said, keep up praying for me, man. I'm going to get out of here. You know, and he really believed that he had... At 
But the word deliverance here is a unique word. You know what it is? It's soteria, which means salvation. I believe that in my situation, I'm going to be saved. And I'm going to be saved one of two ways. Either I'm going to get better, I want to stay as I am, or I'm going to go be with Jesus. But either one, I'm going to be just fine. He says in uh, verse 24, it is more, uh, verse 23, I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. So he says, if I have life, then what that will mean for me is labor. Um, I, I, I to be, uh, verse 24, I, I want to be in the body convinced of this. I know that I will be uh, with you. Uh, but verse 22, if I go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. So if Paul gets out of there and delivered, he's going to go back to work. He is not going to sit around and say, you know, boy, I feel better. Um, and if I die, God, I just want to have the courage not to deny you along the way. Folks, here's the truth. Somehow you will be delivered. Either you'll get better. And if you do, then glorify God in your deliverance. And if you go home, then you'll be with Jesus. Well, that's no small comfort, is it? I mean, that's a big deal, right? <sighs> Many of you know the story of Eric Little, who was a, a good athlete. He ran the 1924 um, Olympics, and uh, he was a Scotsman who wanted to serve his country. He wanted to live for Jesus, though, most of all. And so when he found out that his race was supposed to be on Sunday, he said, I won't run. And they said, you're a traitor. You've betrayed your country, you know, and, and you're worse than that. You're sucking up all these funds we sent you with to take care of you. He said, I can't help that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to run on Sunday. Uh, he ran a different race, a different time, and won, set a medal, set a world record in a quarter mile and they said, oh, you're the hero after all, you know. So he was delivered twice, right? He was delivered, if this doesn't change, I'll go back to Scotland. And I, I, I will go back as a man who have lived for Jesus. But if I do change, I will glorify Christ in my body. He won all kinds of medals. They offered him a whole bunch of stuff. He went to China to serve as a missionary with his life. If God delivers me, this means Better labor for me. And so he did it and died in a POW camp when Japan invaded uh, China. He was delivered twice. I don't know, folks. Don't be discouraged. Don't give up wishing you could just die. Um, be encouraged. You will be delivered at the right time. The last thing I, I want you to see um, I, I kind of blew by it is in verse 21. You know, Paul says, look, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Fill this, fill this sentence for me. What really makes you feel alive? You know, is, is being alive like, you know, uh, going on a great expedition trip to the Arctic, you know, circle or doing some cool thing or a hunting trip or a fishing trip or being surrounded by all your family or a wonderful Christmas time, you know. He says, for me to live is Christ. I know what my purpose in my life is. Isaiah 43, 7 says this, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, I formed and made. And so he says, you and me were created for God's glory. For to me to live is Christ. Question, how are you glorifying Christ with your body, your thoughts, your skills, your personality? How are you glorifying Christ? Paul says, that's what makes all this stuff. So, so as a servant, I don't care if I'm in jail or not. I want to glorify Christ. So let's say you can't move. Would you please fill a golden bowl with prayers on our account? That's no small thing. I can tell when people pray. Would you please pray for this church? Would you pray for a revival of our area? 
you know, more and more people are walking away from faith altogether. Oh, God, would you pray that God would revive us? If you were a letter writer, some, some, you, you know, you're created to glorify God by just writing letters of encouragement. Some of you are just wonderful at that, you know. So I don't know what the deal is. I don't know how you're wired. What your thing is, but I know you're not created to fulfill your own dreams and to make your own self really, really happy. Sorry, Disney. You know, it's not about fulfilling your dreams and being the best you can be. It's about glorifying God with what God's given you. Question. What's God given you? Because for Paul, for him to live, was well, not his profession, not his reputation. It was his Christ. And that meant to die for him was gain. He didn't know whether to stay or go, you know, because either way, he won. But he could have different glasses by the way he saw his circumstances. Father, I'm here somehow for your glory. How is your hospital bed or your infirmity or your loss for God's glory? I don't know. But it's for you to find out. So here's what I want you to do, please, if you would. Ask God to reveal to you how he wants you to glorify him in what way. So I think for me, he wants me to serve, to teach, and communicate the words of God to as many as are able to hear. That's why I do what I do. Why were you made? I don't know. I think then we said uh, a, few, a few things. You know, I think that Christians can find good in the bad. I think Christians can absolutely be sure of their deliverance. They might have to suffer for a while, but they're going to be, they're going to be delivered, saved in the end. And thirdly, this is unique to Christianity, folks. We have meaning and purpose in this life. So, for many, that really will mean dying to self, who we used to be, and living for Jesus. Yeah, I, I wish you could be here. We're going to do baptism now, uh, outside. And so that is a symbol of those who have died to themselves and are now living for Christ. Um, so, you know, by God's grace, would you just ask God to give you different glasses? I'm not minimizing the difficulty. I'm trying to maximize the power of seeing God's hand in our lives. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this passage. God, thank you for what you do. And um, I pray for my brothers and my sisters, God, some of whom feel as though in some ways they're like Paul. They are confined. They can't do or be what they would like to do and be. Help them, Father, see your hand of good in the bad. And maybe even how you're using the bad to make it better. Oh God, I do pray too that we not lose hope. Whatever else Paul was, man, he was full of hope. God, may we not lose hope because our deliverance is certain. And then last, oh God, help us know why we were born. That is, we know why that to glorify you, but help us know in what way we're supposed to glorify you. Bless this dear congregation, not just as they read or hear but as they do what you, by your Holy Spirit, instruct us through your word to do. Teach us, God, yes. Transform us, O Christ, I pray. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.